And I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. I like to begin with a story of a young couple. This young couple moved into a new neighborhood. They just shifted their home to a new community. And the very first morning they got up and they were having their cup of tea together as wife and husband. And they could look through the window and see the neighbor. And uh, through the window of their uh, living room, they could actually see their neighbor's house. And uh, they saw that the, the neighbor lady was hanging the clothes on the hangers, on the lines. And uh, the lady, this couple, uh, the woman said to her husband, Honey, look at those clothes that our neighbor lady is hanging on the clothesline. It looks so dirty. I don't think she knows how to wash her clothes very well. That clothes are hanging for drying, but it's dirty. And so day one, it happened like that. And second day, it happened same. And then she said, maybe she's not using the soap correctly. Maybe she's not rinsing enough. Maybe she's in a hurry or something is wrong that her clothes are dirty. And the third day, this husband got up in the morning before the wife uh, was out in the living room with a cup of tea in her hand, the husband went and cleaned uh, the, the, the glasses, the cleaned the windows of their newly moved home. And his wife came in and said, the lady is hanging the clothes today. I wonder who helped her, who taught her how to wash the clothes. Today, the clothes are clean. Little did she knew that her husband had to clean the glasses of their own house in order to see that the clothes on the lines were actually clean. This psalm today that we have from Psalm 24 is a reminder to us not to think about others, but to think about ourselves and what needs to happen in our lives if we have to see things the way God wants us to see. Amen? Many times we are blaming others. We are blaming the music. We are blaming the dress code. We are blaming the church. We are blaming uh, so many people for things that are not happening right in our lives. And this morning as we unpack Psalm 24 and we look at what David is intending to communicate to us. I pray that we will come clean before the Lord. And say to the Lord just as what David is telling us in this psalm. And this psalm is also calling out the city of Jerusalem to welcome the king of glory. And this is a messianic psalm. This is a, a psalm that points to the, the, the savior, to, points to the Messiah. Jesus, the king of glory, entering Jerusalem. And many people, many scholars say that this psalm was written at a time when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back to Jerusalem. And this was a psalm, this was a music, this was a song that they wrote to celebrate the, the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Regardless of it, it was a psalm, it was a song used for the beginning of worship. David was calling people to worship God and to celebrate who God is. And this morning as we welcome the king of glory into our hearts. Let's really search our hearts and see whether we can truly say to the Lord. Lord you are welcome in this gate. You are welcome to this gate that I'm opening. Whether I, the Lord can truly come into our hearts. Or whether we can truly go into the presence of God and say to him. Lord come in. Come into my heart. Amen. So. The king of glory, Jesus, he is the focus of the psalm. As you look at Psalm 24, he begins by saying the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. When you enter the presence of God, you must always enter with recognizing who God is. We don't come with an awareness of who we are and what we need or self-focus. But we focus our attention to the Lord. We realize that we are here because of him. 
recognizing that he is the creator. He is the universe. Think of this. David as the king of Israel. As he is writing this psalm. He is the king of a small nation. At the time when David was the king of Israel. There were other powerful nations all around him. Egypt and many other nations. And they all had Romans. And they all had their little gods. They, they had their gods that they were worshipping. Every nation had their gods. And David was a king of a small nation. Whose god is the creator of the universe. And he is telling the people of Israel that you must realize that you are not a minority here. That you are not a small group but you are part of the family of God who created, who created the heaven and the earth. Hallelujah. Now I don't think David had scientific education. I don't think he had university education to know how the world was, uh, was at that time. I don't think David ever seen the picture of a globe. Let alone understand that water dominated the earth. And the earth is actually positioned in the water. And not earth positioned in. Uh, or the water is positioned in the water. It's the other way around. The earth is dominated by what? Water bodies. And so. Psalm is, by, is saying that the earth is the Lord. And everything in it, the world and all who, all who uh, lives in it. And verse 2, it says, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Think about the incredible revelation that they, uh, David possessed. For him to know that God of the universe have sustained this earth, planet earth, on the waters. Hallelujah. That our God is the, not the little demigods that these pagans worship. But our God is the king of glory. He is the Lord of the universe. One who created this earth. That revelation changes everything. That revelation of knowing that my God is the God of the universe. He is not confined to a small rock or a little wood. Or he's not confined to a small community of people. But my God is on the throne of the universe. And he holds this universe on the palm of his hand. And we worship him. Amen. And so Psalmist, he goes on to talk about this almighty God. This sovereign God who is the creator of all. Who dwells in a higher place. And the place that he ascribes to, ascribes to here is the hill of the Lord. He talks about, he references it to be the hill of the Lord. Look at verse 3. It says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And so today we have actually titled our message, a hilltop generation. A generation that will ascend to the presence of God. A generation that will climb to the mountain of the Lord. And I'm not talking about the generation to come. But I'm talking about you and me. This present generation. A generation that will seek the presence of God. A generation that will hunger for God. Are you following me today? The one it says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Very powerful. When you think about the God of the universe, how can you approach him? When Moses was in the presence of God at the burning bush, God spoke to him and said, take off your shoes. Take off your shoes because you are standing on holy ground. And when we come to the presence of God, there is something very significant. There is some preparedness. There is some readiness. That not everybody can come into the holy presence of God. Amen. So the concept of God on the mountain. If I can have that screen uh, turned on, please, uh, Rajesh. The concept of God on the holy mountain in the Old Testament. If you, if you look at, you will, you will study in the scriptures that. There is a great depth of teaching about God in the mountains. There is so many references to the holy mountain in the Old Testament. It's a significant theme in the Old Testament. 
But as you study the scripture, you will find that God in the holy mountains is not just an Old Testament concept, but it is also throughout the scripture. It begins with the Garden of Eden, the mountain. The Garden of Eden being the first mountain and in Genesis and it ends in the book of Revelation with New Jerusalem as the ultimate mountain, the, the new mountain that we're talking about. In Genesis, why is it that the Garden of Eden is referenced to as the, uh, as the highest place on earth? In fact, uh, scholars say that the Garden of Eden that God created was in the central center of the universe. And it was one of the highest places on earth. And it was at an elevated position. And therefore in Genesis chapter 2 verses 10 to 14 it says... Uh, the description, uh, uh, an enigmatic uh, description of, uh, of this place uh, called the Garden of Eden. It says there were rivers. There is some um, uncertainty about the, the unique uh, rivers that flew from uh, the Garden of Eden. But definitely there were four rivers that is mentioned there. The description implies that for a river to flow from the garden, the garden had to be at an elevated place. And therefore, the Garden of Eden was a place of high position topographically, geographically. And so in keeping with that understanding of the garden being the first mountain prophet Ezekiel, uh, talks about the Garden of Eden in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13 to 16. Prophet Ezekiel says the garden of God. He calls the garden of Eden as the garden of God. The mountain of God is the garden of God. And he says it is the holy mountain of God. So the garden of Eden, Prophet Ezekiel calls it the mountain of God. That's the first mountain of God's dwelling. Amen? Or we can think about in Genesis chapter 22... Where we have another mountain, Mount Morai or Mount Moria. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son to go up to Mount Moria into God's presence in order to sacrifice his son. And where God provides another sacrifice instead of his own son. You know that story. I don't have time to go into details. But again... The place of sacrifice was a place of God's domain where in God's presence you bring your very best to God. Amen. And so when you come to the presence of God, you come with the presence of God with a heart of obedience and full surrender and readiness to give everything to the Lord. Whatever he requires. And so in the case of Abraham, what was it that God demanded? His only son that he waited for so long. Prayed for so long and God gives him a promised son in Isaac. And God says, I want you to bring him and then sacrifice. Offer him as a sacrifice to me on the Mount of Moriah. As Abraham obeyed God, what does God do? God honors him. And he makes a provision on this mountain so that Isaac could be spared. Amen. Amen. When you obey God's call and you climb into his presence and you reach his presence, there is God's providence. When you bring everything to the house of God and you give everything to him unreservedly and unquestionably and you offer to God everything you got, your talents, your resources, your education, your wealth, everything you give to God, what does God do? He's not going to starve you and send you out as a beggar. But he's going to give you multiplied, multiplied provisions. Amen? Sovereign provisions. And that's what we see. Isaac was asking father Abraham. Abraham, I see the knife. I see all the things that you need for the sacrifice. But where is the animal? Where is the animal that is going to be laid? Can you imagine what was going through the mind of Isaac during that time? What is my dad up to? He had no clue. But Abraham had a laser focused commitment to the Lord. That he was willing and committed to give whatever 
that God was asking. Are you ready to give God whatever he is asking? Are you ready to offer to him whatever he demands? Even if it is your only son, God calls him and says, give your only son to the ministry. How many of you will say, yes, take my son and I will give him to you. I know now in many cultures when families have a lot of children and there was a time I, I know in the 70s and in 80s, at least from my state where I come from, when families had eight or nine kids, average families had seven to eight kids in the 70s and 80s, the state that I come from. And the one who could not pass high school was the one that was often sent to Bible school. Because he cannot become an engineer or he cannot become a doctor, therefore let's make him a pastor. And so a lot of people who grew from that generation of, of culture thinks that all pastors are useless for everything else. They became pastors or they became servants of God because they are not good for anything else. And so when a lot of those people who, who are today well off in many European countries and Western countries and they see pastors and they say, oh, here comes another one of those dumb fellow begging for money because he got nothing else to do better in his life. Let me tell you that's not the case. That's not the case with those who have been given to the Lord by God, by God's people with a sincere heart. Amen. You know, I don't believe that I became a pastor because I'm not good at anything else. I believe if 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 <laughs> I, I tried something else, I know that I could have become successful. I know that I could have done well. But doing what God calls you to do and become successful within the will of God requires these kind of Abrahamic commitment to see the provisions of God. Amen? Let me move on because our time is up. If you look at Exodus chapter 19 verse 24, we see another mountain. It's a Mount Sinai where Israel is wandering in the wilderness. Wondering where God's presence is and looking for God, hoping they will find uh, the presence of God and they will see the, the promise of God and they will be restored uh, into the promised land that God has uh, given them and God meets Moses up on a mountain called Mount Sinai. Hallelujah. And you know, that's the place where Moses received the promise of God. Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai represents, represents a place of God's promise. We come to another mountain in the Bible. And that is the Mount Zion. This is the place God has been uh, marched up into this holy hill. Showing that God is the creator of all things. He is holy. He is lifted up. Mount Zion is a place of God exalted. Enthroned. And we have to ascend into his presence. But we are lowly, we are weak, we are sinful, and we cannot reach that place of Mount Zion. We are creatures unworthy of ascending into God's presence. But the Bible is telling the story over and over again of the mountains in the Bible. Now think about this. This mountain uh, that God talks about in the Bible is called the Tower of Babel. Yeah, how many of you know this mountain? What is uniqueness about this mountain? This was a man-made mountain. This was not God's design. But the idea was that if God thinks he can send a flood and kill everybody on earth, we're going to, with our own ability, our own wisdom, going to create a mountain so high that it will reach God that no flood can destroy us again. And that was the idea behind the pagan kings who set up the Tower of Babel. They wanted to go into a place of highest place or highest position. And in this mountain, what happened? The story of Babel. They wanted to make a name great for themselves, not a name great for God. They wanted to build a civilization that demonstrated their power, their might, their empire. Isn't that the world is trying to do even today? You go to uh, big, big cities, metropolitan cities. You see this high rise towers. How many of you remember the twin towers in New York? It, it was a spectacular 
a thing to behold if any one of you i had the privilege to be there many times before 911 happened and i i had the privilege to see the twin towers i had the privilege to be on it on that towers but what happened it is now called what what is it called it's called ground zero it's called ground zero the tallest building on earth is now become ground zero man's attempt to build big things and it is within mankind to somehow by their own abilities to create a civilization that will make them feel good and that's part of the problem with the culture that we are living in today even in the eastern culture where we had a god conscious society once upon a time our today's generation if you look at the younger generation is not talking about how can i reach god or how can i reach the presence of god but the question that the young generation is asking is how can i entertain myself how can i make myself happy what can i do so that i can feel good that's the question of today's generation but the way how god designed us with this incredible inner uh passion to know god to seek him to find him was put in us by god and and human tendency is always to nip that out take god out of the picture so tower of, tower of babel what did god do god destroyed it with confusing their la- languages god destroyed their plan anything that we try to do with our own strength to reach a pinnacle or a highest highest success in our life without god without god's presence let me tell you there would be confusion without god's presence in our life you can never reach your destiny there will be confusion there will be chaos tragedy is happening around the world today and i want to call you today back as david is calling us to recognize the sovereign creator of the universe and to desire a hunger and a thirst for him and so we come to this city in the new testament it is a new covenant and the beautiful thing about the david psalm psalm 24 is a beautifully fitting to the old covenant and it also fits the new covenant everything about psalm even though it is written before christ is so appropriate for the new covenant as well so in the new testament the concept of a holy mountain is a city linked to the new jerusalem if you read the book of hebrews uh the writer of the book of hebrews exhorts his readers to remain faithful to the new covenant inaugurated by jesus christ rather than returning to the older covenant associated with mount sinai in doing so the hebrew writer says but you have come to mount sion look at hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 He says but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem Hallelujah The Mount Zion is not a physical landmark of a building anymore but it is a spiritual place of God's presence that is you and me his temple birth through the new covenant in Jesus Christ What a powerful powerful turnaround of of things as you see in the book of revelation chapter 21 apostle john he talks about this vision he was carried away in the spirit and we read in verse 10 revelation chapter 21 verse 10 it says in the spirit to a great high mountain and god showed him a holy city and this city is called what jerusalem the holy city of jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god wow do you see it with your spiritual eyes right now what john is seeing how many of you have visions like that how many of you have dreams like that 
That, those are the kind of things that God says your young people will see dreams when he talks the scripture talks about dreams. Your young will see dreams and your old will prophesy. Yeah? It's talking about this kind of revelation. When you have a revelation of the creator of the universe, he will download some heavenly mysteries to you that only you can see and nobody else. So in both contests, the mountain location of New Jerusalem resonates with the pattern found in the Old Testament. God dwells in a holy mountain or a holy city. Those who dwell with him must be holy in order to live within the extended metropolis of his holy mountain. God is not interested in the looks, in the education, in the wealth or our human capacity. But he is looking for something so unique, so different. And that's where David is taking us in this psalm. So the question remains, who can ascend to this holy hill? Who can come into this presence that is so holy? Think about this. David is asking a very important question. Who? Who can go up to his presence? To see the sustainer, the redeemer, the creator of the universe. Can you just walk up to his presence? And he gives some qualifications. He, just not, he does not leave us trying to make us wonder what that is and trying to make us figure this out. But he, he talks about it and he gives us some answers. In fact, uh, he talks about this in Psalm 15. The citizens in God's holy city belongs only to those who are sanctified by God. Let's look at Psalm 15 and we're looking at verse 2 to 5. And here again, psalmist talks about, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who will dwell in your holy hill? Go to your Bibles. Psalm 15, verse 2 onwards. It says, the one who, whose walk is blameless. Everybody say blameless. blameless. The one who does what is righteous. Everybody say righteous. Who speaks the truth from their heart. Everybody say truth from their heart. <laughs> Whose tongue utters no slander. Come on repeat after me. Whose tongue utters no slander. <laughs> who, does no, who does no wrong to a neighbor. <laughs> and casts no slur on others. <laughs> who despises a wild person. But honors those who fear the Lord. Who keeps an oath even when it hurts. And does not change their mind. Who lends money to the poor without interest. Who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Now David says whoever does these things will never be shaken. Wow. What a set of standards Psalmist is talking about whose walk is blameless, who speaks truth, whose heart is full of truth, who does not slander with his tongue, does not evil to his neighbor. Wow. Do good things to the neighbor to bless your neighbor. Yeah. How many of you in going up to your apartment find some trash in front of your door? And instead of picking it up, you just kick it with your foot to the neighbor's door. I've seen people who do that. You're doing evil to your neighbor. And that's exactly what Psalm is, is talking about here. And then he says, uh, those who honor the Lord, those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own herd and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest. This is, this is a very interesting thing. Never give money to people, poor people who comes to ask you for a loan and put an interest on that. And that's one of the reasons I stop giving people money on loan. And I tell people, I have no money to give you loan. But here it is. This is what I can give you free. Take it. This is to bless you. This is all I can do. 
I can give you free what I can give you from my capacity, but I'm not going to give you any loan with interest or without interest because what I found from my life experience, maybe there's at least about 10 lakhs rupees that are out there that people have taken loan from me. Today, they are neither my friends. I don't know even where they exist. I have lost their contact. They disappeared off the planet Earth simply because I was generous to give them a loan. Instead of making friends, I lost a bunch of friends. And in the process, I lost a bunch of money to people whose heart was not right to begin with. Because if their heart was pure, they would not have disappeared from my life. You get it? And so do they really deserve our money? No. Such people do not deserve our money at all. Such people do not deserve our generosity either. Does not take a bribe against the innocent. Who does these things shall never be bored. And so it is the same concept that David is bringing in Psalm 24. Where he also uh, speaks of the one who can ascend to the hill of the Lord. And he asks this question. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in his holy place? Psalm 24 verse 3. Once again, the concept of holy mountain is associated with God's presence in the sanctuary. As the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem. It's talking about the mountain of the Lord. Same as in Psalm 15. And so what is the answer? Verse 4. It says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to a false god. And does not swear deceitfully. This is a very brief answer. Whereas in Psalm 15 you have a more elaborated answer to the one who can climb to the presence of God. Here it is a bit more short. But it is really to the point. It covers everything that David intends to cover here. The mention of clean hands and pure heart. And when you look at that. Clean hands and pure heart. It's talking about moral uprightness. It's talking about moral rightness. So God is interested in a moral holiness. Which is something that today's world is least interested in. Everything that the world and the world system is going away from these kind of moral values. Whereas all the while, whether it is in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, Old Covenant or New Covenant, God is always interested in moral holiness. And that's why I tell people, how is it that God is going to judge those people who have never heard the name of Jesus, never had the opportunity, even within the Old Covenant, made to uh, had the opportunity to know God's principles and God's ways. And in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, after Jesus, I'm sure thousands of people have died without ever even knowing about Jesus. How is God going to judge them? Is it their fault that they never got to hear the gospel? How is God going to judge them? God is going to judge them on his moral ground. Hello. Those have died and have never had the opportunity to make a decision for Jesus, they will be judged according to the moral standard of their culture. Because every culture, how primitive it might be, how ancient it might be, is based upon a moral value system. And so they will be judged according to that. So God is always interested in moral purity. And so the hallmark of those who inherit the presence of God, the hallmark of those who can ascend to the hill of the Lord is what? They will be morally pure. The Levites in the Old Testament who are set apart as God's priests uh, to especially to perform the religious uh, rituals of the, the, of the tabernacle and the, uh, the, the, the sanctuary 
uh, they, they were people who had to be ceremoni ceremoniously clean. Exodus chapter 30. Uh, verses 18 to 21. Yeah, we see the instructions of Aaron. The high priest and his sons. To wash their hands and their feet. At the laver in the tabernacle. Before ministering to the Lord. They had to physically wash their hands. And their feet. Uh, before they enter into the sanctuary. We see that same practice uh, even today. The Old Testament practice of that culture. Still inculcated in the Islamic faith, in the, in the Muslim community. They have a place where they can wash their hands and their feet. And, and so much so that every believer uh, has to physically wash their hands and uh, wash their feet uh, before they do their prayers. And so all over the world right now at the airports, they have a prayer room and a place where they can go and wash their hands and feet. Is it interesting? Now, we know somebody who at the time of Jesus washed his hand. But was he clean? Who was it that washed his hand? Pilate. Pilate washed his hand. But was he clean? He literally washes. He asked the servants to bring a bowl of water and he washed his hand in front of them all and said, I have no part in this. So, the literal sense of washing hands and feet, is that going to make you holy? Is that what the Bible is talking about? Jesus came to revolutionize these kind of teachings. To say that God is not looking at your physical cleanliness. Of course, that's important. I'm not saying that we come to church dirty, smelling, not taking shower or not cleaning. Hygiene is very much, very important. Cleanliness, somebody said, is next to godliness. But that is not what God is looking at. He is looking at the purity of our heart. Amen? Clean hands. I mean, this has become a big thing after COVID, right? Clean hands. Even now, everywhere you go, at airports and uh, as you board the plane, they still make those announcements to keep your hands sanitized at all times. Frequently, they say, frequently sanitize your hands. And most of us carry one in our hands, right? Uh, carry a little bottle to clean our hands. And I, I remember there was a time hardly many men went to the toilet and washed their hands. Most men will just go in and come out. But now... Thank God, COVID has revolutionized men's behavior. Even men wash their hands after going to toilet. So clean hands, it has become a, a big thing. In, in, in the, in the, in, it is talking about a righteous behavior rather than the physical act of cleaning. In Job, in the book of Job, chapter 17, verse 9, we read, it says, At the righteous holds to his way. And he who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger. It's talking about righteous behavior. It is also opposite to the idea of having blood on one's hand. In the Old Testament, it, when you commit sin, when you, your actions are not in line with God's plan and purposes, it refers to having blood on your hands. That means you are guilty. So a biblical metaphor that fittingly came over into the English language to expose somebody who is obviously guilty is to have blood on his hand. But pure hands, pure, pure uh, clean hands, talking about Righteous behavior. But pure hearts. It's talking about righteous motives. Not only our actions of our hands. But the motive of our heart. Because many times we can do things with our hands. And in our heart we behave differently. Remember the story of the child. Who broadly told the dad. Dad, do you want me to shut up and sit down? 
I am sitting down, but in my heart, I am standing. Remember that story? I'm sure, I'm wondering what that dad would have felt like at that moment. Uh, some of these kids, especially today's generation kids, are so, so smart. From such a small age, they have such a, whew. I watch some of these reels on Facebook with small kids and their conversations and their talks, it's beyond me. When I was a kid of their age, I was stupid and naive. Compared to what they know today. It's unbelievable. So Jesus is pointing out to the assertion of adultery taking place in our hearts. Matthew chapter 5 verse 27 and 28. It underscores that a, a person can technically have clean hands and yet lacks pure heart. So our actions... Of our hands and the purity of our heart. Indeed, these hand and heart stands in this first half of the verse 4, and it is very difficult to attain. How many of you can truly say, I have clean hands? How many of you can truly say, I have pure heart? Not many of us can boldly say that. It's a very difficult one. But when the Bible talks about clean hands, it's not talking about a religious ritualistic purification. Though there is importance to that, it's talking about things that you have done with your hands. Things that you, that you avoided, the injustice or the act of violence or you have used these hands to do some wrong things, you know. Uh, it is about those things. You stole things or, you know, you slapped somebody wrongly. And it is those kind of things that, 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 that the Bible is talking about. The Bible also says that you have to have a pure heart in that, you know, it's talking about the righteousness of God. Uh, manifested through our uh, daily life. So it's, it's not something very easy to attain. Uh, and then it, uh, the psalmist brings it to, in verse uh, chapter 24, looking further, it says, uh, not only one who has clean hands and a pure heart, uh, who does not trust in an idol or swear by false gods, now, that's a very, very difficult one. You may look at yourself as a Christian and say, well, I don't worship an idol. But that's not true. You can be a Christian and you can have idols in your life. And that's why it is very, very cunning one. You know, often we look at these people of other faith and they say, oh, they are all idol worshipers and I don't worship idols. But we can have idols in our lives too. Your wife can be your idol. Hello. Your husband can be your idol. And for parents, their children can be idol, especially when they have the firstborn. Man, they take the central focus of everything in their life and God and the things of God and everything else become secondary because, oh my baby. Oh my baby. Have you seen those parents who are, you know, their mind has gone crazy over their, their kid. Uh Oh, don't, if somebody, if I come to church with my baby, people in the church will come and touch our baby. I don't want the fingerprints of, of the people in our church touching our baby, so I don't want to go to church. I've seen couples like that. They want to raise their child in a glass bubble. But have you seen those kids in the slum? Huh? And I always wonder, they live in filth. Their body is full of mud and, 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 and flies sitting on their lips and they have no sickness. They're healthy. And some of us who are crying over people in our church touching my baby and I can't go to church, their kids are always sick. Have you noticed that? Their parents are always running to the doctor's clinic. Oh, temperature is up. And the doctor is so smart. He will give you medicine for one day and he will take a fee of 600 rupees 
and these days a lot of uh, pediatricians they themselves give the tablets they don't ask you to go to a chemist and buy they will give you the medicine for one day and they won't give you medicine to take home they will say i have given you the medications for today let's see how the child is going to be come back tomorrow little do you know that this is their gimmick to extract money out of you and so i know of many couples even christian couple who live their life with their little baby in their lap living in clinics spending all of their hard earned money giving to these doctors and yet will never come to church but you realize sitting in that clinic there are 20 couples with their sick babies all sniffing and coughing and sick you sit there waiting for the doctor's appointment 3 hours exposed to all these virus at clinic that is fine but come to church oh have you seen those god is looking for a different type of people if they are to experience his presence and then david talks about verse 5 uh, sorry verse 4 uh, who does not swear by a false god who does not swear by things and make vows or make confessions that means you need, you should not have any deceit inside of you this is very simple that just simply means you cannot tell lies you have to be a person of honesty and truth uh, uh and and justice a true worshipper a true believer uh, does not practice deception or lies now what is a lie well you tell the pastor pastor see you at church on sunday morning right during the midweek meeting you have the midweek gatherings right at the end you when you say goodbye to the pastor see you at church on sunday you already know in your heart that you are not coming to church on sunday and yet you made a promise to the pastor what see you on sunday why did you say to the pastor see you on sunday at the time of goodbye is because at that time you want the blessing from the pastor you want the pastor to pray for you and therefore to make the pastor happy you say i'll see you at the church all the while it was a lie you cannot ascend to the presence of god if you are living in lies and deception amen not keeping your promise if you say i'm going to be at a place at a given time 8 o'clock 8 o'clock i know that there are unforeseen and difficult circumstances at times may delay our commitments to being punctual on time but again god sees your heart you have to take into account the traffic delays you have to take into account maybe the 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 tire of your car may get punctured on the way keep that margin in your mind when you make a commitment and say i'll be at a place at 8 o'clock don't you do that for your legal appointments don't you do that for your school appointments don't you do that for your parent teachers meeting then what exception do you have when it comes to the things of god that we can just get away with telling lies he who has a clean hand he who has a pure heart one who does not worship false gods and one who does not tell deceit and lies raise your hands if you made it through all these qualifications i put my hand down because the bible says in psalm 14 psalm 14 verse 2 and 3 it says there is not one who does good <laughs> not even one so there is a problem there is a problem what is the problem such person does not exist <laughs> as the very words of ecclesiastics 7 verse 20 
says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And anyone who reads Psalms 24 verse 4 and blindly thinks that you have clean hands, check, you have pure heart, that's me. I never break my promises and I worship all the time and I worship in the ways that please the Lord alone. Okay, it's time to climb the hill and enter into his presence. Let me tell you, such a person would not survive this journey. But Psalmist is saying, no, you just can't just wander in to the presence of God. So the solution, David does not leave us with the problem, but he gives us a solution. Let's go to verse five. It says, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, their savior. Wow. There is a savior who will save you and who will help you to get to the mountain of God. Who is the savior that David is talking about? Jesus. Hallelujah. If there is a problem, there is a solution. The solution is Jesus. He is the only one who can give us a clean hand. He is the only one who can give us a pure heart. Hallelujah. And when you are saved by God, your good deeds will always produce what? Blessings. Blessings of God. Blessings of God overtakes all those who are children of God who are doing good deeds. Hallelujah. I know some of you, I won't tell name. There are some of you who have decided that every Sunday, every Sunday, I'm going to bless somebody. I'm going to do something to bless someone. I know some of you may be doing that. Do good works. Out of pure motives. And I will tell you. God will bless you. Blessings comes from. The good works of your hands. But there is something more to it. Something more to it. Such is the generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face God of Jacob. In the Bible in the Old Testament. We talk about you know uh, righteousness. Blessings of God and righteousness. Most of us, we want blessings from God, but we don't talk about righteousness much. We want to talk about the blessings of God. But David here is talking about the righteousness of God that enables you to enter into the presence of God. And our own righteousness, the Bible says, is as bad as filthy rags. Amen? Our self-righteousness is as bad as filthy rags. And so the only righteousness through which we can enter the very presence of God is through putting on the righteousness of God that we have received from Jesus Christ. So it is possible for you and for me to receive the king of glory to enter in and take lordship of our life and clean these hands and clean this heart and make us pure by his precious blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. And we can come into his presence today. We can enter into his very presence to the holy hill of the Lord. God, David is reminding of the promise of God. The righteousness of God that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, Abraham, Jacob, and the generations of those who seek him. And we are part of that covenantal promise of God, my friends. The blessings of God awaits you. The righteousness of God awaits you on this Palm Sunday, even as the people are celebrating what happened 2,000 years ago. I want to encourage you that you will not be part of that crowd cheering Jesus and then the next day go and say crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. But one who truly say opening these gates to you, come in, be the Lord of my life, be the Lord of my life. Amen. So verse 5 is talking about 
receiving the blessing from the Lord and receiving the righteousness, the vindication in the Hebrew language is talking about righteousness. That's the vindication that we receive from the Savior. So our salvation is not the product of our good works. Let me clear that very clearly, that our salvation do not come from our good works. Because you've given it to the poor, you've done charity, you're not saved. You do charity and what do you get? What do you get? Blessings. Remember that. You do good works, you get blessings. But how do you get righteousness? How do you get a clean hand? How do you get a pure heart? By allowing the king of glory to enter and reign in your lives. And be the Lord over your lives. Amen. This is not mentioned in Psalm 24. But it's very important to understand this. That when the Israelites went up to the temple. When the Israelites went up to the temple. In Jerusalem. They always took a sacrifice with them. God's Lord demanded in the Old Testament. For the removal of the guilt. Through the offering of a perfect animal. A substitute for their sin. Every day the priest offered. Two perfect lambs. One in the morning and one in the evening. So that no one would ever enter God's presence without an acceptable sacrifice. This was done in the synagogues. And even today in the New Testament. Do you think there is some truth to what the priest did in the Old Testament? Is there a truth to that? Yes, we don't need to bring a goat or a lamb to sacrifice here. But the truth is that the perfect lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God was slain for you and for me. The one who has clean hands, the one who has pure heart was sacrificed on the altar for you and for me. Do you see it, my friends, today? That's what G David is appealing to us. And he's appealing to Jerusalem. Open ye gates. Open ye gates. Look at verse 8. Now verse 7. Lift up your heads. You gates be lifted up by ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. In the ancient England, in the English uh, culture, in England, when the king would enter the city of his palace, if he had gone out and he wanted to come back into his palace, the king and his, oh, the whole entourage will come uh, to the gate of the palace and the gate always remains closed and the, 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 the people who are guards at the front of the procession will come to the gate and will shout open the gates and from the other side the guards will ask the question who is there and the guard from this side will shout and say the king of England is here suddenly the gates open and the king will enter with joyful procession into his palace. I don't know whether they still do that in London or not. But this was a practice. Charles Spurgeon talks about this practice in one of his sermons on Psalm 24. And I thought it echoes what David is talking about in Psalm 24. Jesus is standing at your door. And he's saying, knock, knock. And you say, who is there? And he says, I'm the king of glory. And you say, opening my doors, opening my gates. Jesus, come inside of me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who is this king of glory? Who is this king of glory? He is not coming on a donkey, my friends. Hello. Hello. He's not a coming any, on a donkey anymore. He's going to come on chariots. 
the sound of trumpets, the royal procession. And the Bible says the whole world will see. And there are prophecies that Jesus will appear again on the east side of Jerusalem on Mount Sinai. And there was a pagan uh, king who ruled, who captured Israel, who had this crazy fear that Jesus would come through this gate in East Gate in Jerusalem. And so what this king did is he ordered the people to close this gate permanently. And so today the East Gate uh, where this, this prophetical uh, words about Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem is blocked with thick wall. Big, thick wall. Literally, they closed it. Do you think he's a smart king? The king of glory. The psalmist is talking about the earth is the Lord and everything in it and in the world and who live in it. The foundation of it on the seas and establishing it on the water. He is coming. Do you think a thick wall that blocks the gate is going to stop Jesus from entering? And anything stop Jesus from entering? Nothing. Nothing. Psalmist begins by talking about this great, mighty, awesome king of glory. And then he talks about who can enter into this very presence of God. And then he finally finishes up by saying, what stops you now? He stops by Saying this question to you and to me today. What stops you from entering into the very presence of God? A psalmist often says, search me Lord. Try me if there is any wicked ways in me. How many of you will say, Lord, clean my hands. Give me a clean hand. Give me a clean hand, Lord. Yes, Jesus. You make that prayer to God. I don't... I don't need to force you. You heard the word today. You know what you need to do. Maybe some of your actions needs to change. Some of the things that you do with your life needs to change. Would you, come, would, you, would, you, would you give up those things that is not pleasing to you? How about your heart? <clears throat> you want blessings from God? You want the righteousness of God? Let's surrender our hands and our hearts to the Lord. Blessings of God will overtake you. The righteousness of God will be yours so that you can come and enter into His very presence. Maybe you are hearing this message today and that you never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You never allowed Jesus to to come into your heart. Maybe you put a, a blockage. You said, Jesus, I know you. I heard about you. I just want to keep you there. I want to make you the central point of my life. Will you open your heart and say, Jesus, I confess my sins. I open my hearts. Ask you to cleanse me, wash me, and be the king, be the savior that David is talking about so that I can be in your presence, so that I can be blessed by you, so that I can be made righteous, so that I can experience your presence, Lord. Not just for life on this earth, but the new Jerusalem that you are preparing for us in eternity. Only those who have clean hands and a pure heart will enter this presence of God.